All right, at this point, we are welcoming in all those who are joining us online. It is good to gather in worship today. Our theme is the Psalms of Confession. Uh, my name is Patty Agnew, and we are here in Livingston, Montana. And so the churches of Park County, the Methodist churches here of Grace and Holbrook and Pine Creek and Shields Valley welcome you all to join us today. And so we join together in reflecting on the Psalms, the Psalms of Confession. And so as we've been talking, Psalms are a unique style of writing in our scripture. They're not history, they're not law, they are not story. What they are is poems. And as poems, they express our hearts, the true thoughts and feelings of our hearts through colorful language and metaphor, most psalms were written by individuals in response to something they were going through in their life and then they were brought to worship and set to music and then became hymns that were used in worship and most psalms um, we can't really trace down the historical setting uh, but we we recognize that the feelings they experienced way back then are the same feelings we experience though our historical and cultural settings are different. But today's psalm is an exception to that in that we absolutely do know the historical setting to which it was written in response to. The introduction to the psalm tells us that it was a psalm written by King David in response to his adultery with Bathsheba. And that story is told in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And so in this point in David's life, uh, he is king, um, and it seemed like everything he touched turned to gold. His army was powerful, and under his leadership, Israel was conquering all the neighboring lands and, and countries. And David must have been feeling pretty good about himself and his leadership. And so one day, he sent his army out to battle, but he stayed home which was not what was normal. And when he was home and all the men were out to war, he was up on his rooftop one night and, and down on another rooftop, he saw Bathsheba taking her bath. And he sent for her and she came to him and they slept together. And then he uh, was able to have her husband killed so that he could take her as his wife. And that all went on that slippery slope of sin, right? You make one bad choice and next thing you have to make another bad choice. And, and we've all experienced that to some degree, maybe not as extreme as it was for King David. But one little act snowballed into adultery and then murder and that truly is the way that sin works. And his ego was so big at the time, he felt like he was above the law. God tried to get his attention, but King David wasn't listening. Either he was living in denial or somehow justifying his actions like we tend to do when we are guilty. But this would not last. Soon, God sent, Nathan, his, God sent David's best friend, Nathan, to convict him of his sin by telling him a story. And in that process, David came to his senses. And this powerful, heartfelt psalm is the result of that uh, humility and that conviction, and it is his confession to his sin. So listen to the psalm. We're going to read the first 12 verses of Psalm 51, and you can hear the sincerity of his heart and the desperation of his soul um, and his absolute dependence upon God for mercy. And he has uh, wonderful uh, metaphors in here as well. So Psalm 51 starts like this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions 
and my sin is always before me. Against you, and you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So this psalm teaches us some important things about confession. First, David begins by remembering who God is. God is not a God of guilt. God doesn't sit around and wait for us to make a mistake so he can punish us with sin. God is a God of love and mercy. And it is important to remember that. It also is good to remember that we can't absolve ourselves. We can't change our own hearts and our own power. We need God to do that heart work. God specializes in that. And so David remembers that God is a God of steadfast love, of abundant mercy, and that God can wash our sins away. And then second, David admits to his wrongdoing. He owns up to it. And note what is not in the psalm. There are no excuses. There are, is no blaming. There's no justifying what he did. David takes full responsibility for his actions. And that is important in our practice of confession. We need to own up to our wrongdoing or our omission, what we didn't do. We need to admit what we have or haven't done. And then David also recognizes that the sin ultimately is sin against God. This part is not declaring that the, the pain and the suffering on the human level doesn't count because that needs to be dealt with too. But it is recognizing that not only does sin impact the humans in our life, but sin is also against God. And then we confess our sin and ask for forgiveness. I looked up definitions of guilt this week in preparation. And so guilt is described as the distress we feel when we hold up something we did against our values. And the definitions all refer to guilt as an uncomfortable, painful feeling. It's an emotion that causes distress in our, in our hearts and our souls. Now, there's a reason we feel guilt. God gave us a conscience. God gave us the ability to feel guilt. And it is important for our own self and for our relationships that we feel the guilt so that we can deal with the harm and the wrong that was done. And so let us take a lesson from David. When we feel that guilt, may we admit it. May we own up to our wrongdoing and seek mercy. As we do, it is helpful to remember who God is. For sometimes we end up holding on to that guilt and not letting ourselves off the hook. We berate ourselves and we get stuck in the feeling of shame. And that is not what God intended. None of that will lead to healing and transformation. So when we come to our senses, when we see our sin, when we get out of the denial and we own up to what we are doing, the next step is confession. And then the next step is accepting 
God's grace and God's mercy. In confession, we bring our whole heart to God and we do not offer excuses or blame others. We just admit what happened and ask for grace. And then God will do God's work in us. And the result at that point should be what David talks about in that final stanza. God gives testimony that God's restoration and healing comes. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore my joy. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now, I'm sure we all have had the experience where we know we need to confess and we do, but then we still feel guilty and feel shame after the fact. We get hung up. We're so aware of our guilt and often we're in places that, that pour shame upon us or the voices in our head and we can't let that guilt go. Well, in the moments that that happens, I think it's important to maybe come back to the psalm. There's several important things. First, start like David did. Remind ourselves of who God is, God's steadfast love, his abundant mercy, God's never-ending grace. Remind ourselves there's nothing you can do to put yourself outside of the reach of God's love. As Roman 8, Romans 8 reminds us, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God doesn't forgive us because we earn it or deserve it. God forgives us because he loves us. And there's nothing we can do to make God stop loving us. There is no limit to forgiveness. Jesus died for all of our sins. Jesus died for all of our sins, and Jesus died for all sins. And so remember that truth and claim that. And if you can't shake that guilt, then there's a few other things you can try. One is to find a safe person that you can confess to, because speaking your guilt out loud helps break the power that it has over you. The silence and the secrets we hold keep us down and hold power over us and fill us with shame. And so sharing with another person can release that power and allow God's healing work to come in. Or write it out on a, in a journal and then even either leave it there or find a way to get rid of that paper, put it through a shredder or whatever can give you the feeling that that guilt and that sin is removed. Now, maybe the guilt won't go away until you initially initiate trying to reconcile with the person. It's one thing to confess to God, but we need to ask for forgiveness from the people that we've offended. And so that might be what's making us hold on to it more. Or here's a new one I came across this week. Find a rock and let that rock represent for you your guilt that you are feeling. And carry that rock around for a while. What's it like to carry that rock around? Note its weight and the burden that it creates. And then remember that God doesn't want you living with burdens and weights, carrying rocks around. God offers a way to release that burden, to let go of the weight. And then put that rock down. Maybe you throw it into your garden so new life can come up around it. Or maybe you toss it into the Yellowstone and know that it's being carried away. Whatever that looks like, allow the rock to represent your guilt and watch it be carried away. Another thing we can do is continue to read these Psalms of Confession because they get past our brain into our heart. And sometimes that's what we need to do in confession is allow the powerful imagery and the colorful language to speak to our hearts and connect us with God in that way. And then remember, there's a great paradox of truth in our faith. The first is, 
the first part of it is this, that every one of us is a sinner. Every human being makes mistakes. Every human being hurts others knowingly and unknowingly. We all cause harm in creation and the world. Every single one of us is inclined to hurt others. Now, I don't need to pound this home because we all typically are very aware of our shortcomings. But the second truth that's equally true and powerful is that each one of us is a masterpiece, a creation of God. Each one of us is special and worthy and loved just as we are. And it's hard to keep those two truths together, that we're sinful and that we're a special, beautiful creation of God. And yet it's true. In God's great love, we can hold those two together. In Jesus, we see his great love that values all people, that hangs out with sinners and outcasts, that includes everyone around the table, even those who are going to betray and deny him. And we see his great love that forgives all guilty people, even the thieves on the cross next to him when he is dying. Even you, even me, no matter what we have done or what we haven't done, God forgives us and pours his mercy upon us and brings healing and restoration to our hearts. So accept that forgiveness. You are inherently worthy. You are loved by God. And so do confess, do admit to your wrongdoing, do ask for forgiveness, but then accept God's steadfast love and unlimited mercy, for that is God's desire for us. And so let me close with a little more time of prayer. And as I do, I invite you to focus on God's great love and to confess whatever burden you might be carrying right now. What are you feeling a little bit of guilt or shame over? What is it that you need to let go of so God's healing power can be released into your heart? Let us pray together. Our gracious God, in these moments on this morning, we recognize we have much to be grateful for and it is good to gather together. And yet under the surface, we carry some guilt. We recognize that we have hurt others or you or ourselves or creation in this last week or so. And we haven't taken the time to admit to that and confess it to you. So we do that now, Lord. We are sorry for the ways that we have not lived in the ways you call us to. Either the things we have done that have caused harm or the things that we haven't done that have also caused harm. Lord, we admit our wrongdoing before you. And we ask for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we are so dependent upon your love. And we are so grateful for your goodness and your mercy. And so we let go of our guilt and hold on to your love. That we might reclaim the joy of our salvation. That our hearts might be restored. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.